Hey, I'm Drew from Drew Build Stuff, and today I'm building this 8.5 foot by 42 inch black walnut and black epoxy dining table from start to finish. I'm building this in my garage with no really special tools, so you might already have a lot of these tools lying around. So I'm starting off with two black walnut slabs that I picked up from a local vendor called Workers Wood in London, Ontario. I think I paid about $400 for the two slabs, which is a pretty good deal considering how big they are. So I started off by chiseling off all the bark. With these interior voids, you want to really take your time and get them as clean as possible because as you'll see later on, I had to refinish my table because there was some of this still left on. I also chiseled out any soft rot wood as this won't finish properly, and then I cleaned it out with a wire brush. Then I just took some 80 grit on my orbital sander and took off any of the remaining bark. Once you have the majority chiseled off, this actually sands off really easily. So now starting on the epoxy mold, I have a 4 by 8 sheet of 3 quarter inch melamine here that I'm just ripping 4 inches off to build the side walls. Since the table I'm building is over 8 feet, I'm just blocking up this 8 foot strip with another 1 foot strip and silicone in the middle. This 9 foot by 45 inch box will be the sides of our mold and I'm also using it now as a template to visualize the layout I want for the slabs. After trying a few layouts and settling on the one I want, just the simple river table layout, I can then sharpie off where these slabs need to be cut. To cut, I'm just using my standard circular saw, and to make sure I'm making perfectly straight cuts, I'm using this Craig Track Jig. I have two of these kits connected together, and I think each kit costs $150. But if you don't have a track saw, just do yourself a favor and go and get one of these kits. You can make perfectly straight cuts, and to be honest, I almost have this on my circular saw all the time. The only downside is you can only cut about an inch and five eighths deep with the track saw, so here I just take it off for a second just to finish up that initial cut that I made. Now I'm just mixing up some two-part epoxy to seal the edges of the slabs. This will stop the slab from releasing air bubbles when you do the full pour and save you a ton of work in the long run. The biggest lesson I can tell you in making one of these tables is just follow the directions as they're laid out and if you don't have one of the tools, just go out and buy it because at the end of the day, you're spending thousands of dollars on slabs and epoxy. The extra couple hundred dollars for the tools you need is well worth the time. Now I'm just sealing the rest of the slab with some shellac. This just stops any staining that the black dye and the epoxy can do to the wood. Now I'm just setting up the base of our mold. Again, we're over eight feet, so I'm just adding on a little piece at the end here with some silicone, and then strapping it on with some scrap pieces of wood. This isn't 100% necessary if you use mold release, but I didn't have any, so I'm sealing the entire mold with tuck tape. Or if you're in the US, I think it's called Tyvek tape. It's just house sheathing tape that the epoxy doesn't stick to. And now I'm just applying some silicone to the walls of the mold and setting it onto the base. And here's a nice view of my dad's butt crack. You're welcome for that. I then apply some silicone to the seam and use my finger to wipe it flush. The biggest thing I can say is silicone is cheap and epoxy is expensive, so make sure this is sealed 100%. I'm then just setting a level around a whole bunch of different spots in the mold and applying shims as necessary until we're perfectly level. Again, I didn't have mold release, so here I'm just using some standard car wax and applying it to the silicone bead just so the epoxy won't stick onto it. 
Now it's been a couple days and our epoxy edges are ready to scuff up. I just use some 80 grit and scuff it up by hand so that the new epoxy we pour has something to stick to because epoxy really doesn't like to stick to uh, its cured self, so we have to scuff it up. Then just make sure you have these slabs and the mold 100% clean, vacuum them if you need to because anything that's left on these is going to end up floating in the new epoxy you pour. So the epoxy I'm using is from Rusty Design in Burlington, Ontario. I ended up using about 55 liters of this, which came out to, I think, about $1,100 Canadian. So I dyed this epoxy black, and I was originally counting my drops, but it took a lot more than I expected. But I did count the whole time. It came out to about 200 drops to get this to the level of black that I wanted it. In hindsight, I should have just used one of these little half ounce containers of dye per three gallon kit of epoxy and it would have saved me quite a bit of time, but live and learn. One tip is you really want to make sure you get this epoxy thoroughly mixed. Definitely buy one of these drill mixers if you don't have one. I'm usually listening to music, so I'll usually just mix for one entire song, making sure to scrape the edges of the bucket and the bottom to make sure everything's thoroughly mixed and we're not going to have any soft spots. So if you want to pour it all at once, you definitely have to clamp your pieces down. I'm just pouring about half of it and then I'm going to let it mostly harden and then I'll pour the rest. That way, one, I'm not risking all the epoxy if the mold has a leak. And two, the mostly hardened epoxy will hold the slabs down and I can just pour the rest right on top. After about 20 minutes, I'll take a torch and go around and just pop any of the air bubbles that have risen to the surface. I don't know if it's 100% necessary, but I don't like to risk it and I just find it satisfying popping these bubbles, to be honest. So I ended up leaving it a day or two longer than I wanted to, so that means I'm going to have to scuff up the surface of this epoxy before I can uh, pour more. If I just left it about two days like I wanted to and the epoxy was still tacky, I could have just poured right on top and it would have chemically bonded to itself, but now it's too hard to do that. So let's mix up another couple batches of epoxy and uh, finish up this pour. Now it's been a little over a week and the epoxy has been fully cured for a few days and I was doing some other cutting in here so there's some dust settled on top but not to worry that's not mixed into the epoxy. So time to release the mold. Now when I said you don't need any professional tools, I guess I was lying about this part as I'm taking the slab to a local wood shop about five minutes away to get this planed on their 48 inch planer. It's some Mennonite guys that own this place and they usually charge me anywhere from 20 to $50 to plane something this big and it takes about 10 minutes so it seems like a no brainer to me. Even if you don't have access to that, uh, you should definitely do some research and find someone with one of these near you or even a CNC planer. You could use a router sled, but honestly, just spend the 100 or $200 it's going to take to get this professionally finished because this is one of the most important parts and you're not going to match it doing it by hand. Plus, it'll just save you like two days of work. So about a half hour later, I'm back in my garage and we're going to cut this to size. Again, I'm just using my circular saw with a 24 tooth blade and the Craig track saw jig. Finished, it's now about 1 and 5 8 inch thick, so I'm about maxing out the cut capacity for my circular saw. 
That's why I use a 24 tooth blade, also known as a rough cut blade, because I can easily sand out any imperfections that leaves, and it's really the only way to cut something that thick without doing multiple passes, which I'm not a fan of. To finish up some of the holes left behind after getting it planed, I'm using this black CA glue and some spray activator. After using the accelerator, you can sand it in about 15 seconds, so it's great for finish, but on this I'm also going to fill up some of the bigger voids with some black epoxy, so we'll have to wait overnight for this one. Once the epoxy is fully cured, you can't really sand it fully off without digging into the wood around it and making it unlevel. So I'll just lightly go over it with the sander to warm it up and then use this backhoe scraper to scrape off the epoxy. Once I'm done with all the epoxy, I'll go back around with that black CA glue and just fill in any of the pinholes that are left. You can sand these off instantly, so you really want to take your time going around the whole table and make sure every little nook and cranny is filled in. And in the meanwhile, I'm just sanding the whole thing down to 120. On the top side, I'm just using an 8th inch roundover bit to give it a professional look and feel. On the bottom side, I'm using a 45 degree chamfer bit, and I had to route this in multiple passes because I was taking off a lot of material. So now I'm just sanding again with 120 and I'm working my way all the way up to 320 grit. You really want to take your time, especially on the black epoxy that will easily show scratches. Working through the grits took me probably about 3 hours to complete on something this size. Again I'd be wiping off the dust regularly just to stop those little pigtail swirly things from happening. One good trick when you're finishing up a grit is use your hand and feel along where you're sanding and you'll immediately notice anything that feels different than the rest and it probably needs more sand in there. Now you just want to get the table as clean as possible and get it ready for finishing. So the finish I'm using is Osmo 3043. I apply it by pouring a little onto the table and troweling it around as much as possible. Then I use these white 3M floor buffing pads and put it on my buffer and just buff it into the fibers for about 5 or 10 minutes until the fibers have absorbed as much as they can. So I'm starting on the bottom side and then we're going to flip it over and do the top at the same time. You want to finish both sides as soon as possible because if you leave one side unfinished that side can absorb moisture and cause the table to bow which is a really not fun problem to fix. This is like a $50 car buffer I got and I just put some velcro tape on the bottom to hold on the pad and it seems to work just fine for what I use it for. Also just a reminder I put links to a lot of the products I use like these 3M floor buffing pads in the description below. If you're going to buy them please just use the link I get a small percentage and it doesn't cost you anymore and it helps me make more videos like this. 
So here I'm just using a microfiber towel and buffing in some of the sides. And the secret to this finish is once you have it buffed in and let it sit for about five minutes, you can then flip over the pad and then just buff off all the remaining Osmo. So now I just check the sheen at a low angle to make sure there's no uneven spots or blemishes. So I noticed right away that there was still some soft wood or bark left where this epoxy fill was. So I'm going to sand this back to 120 and then use some thin CA glue to try to solidify this. After working my way back up the grits to 320 and getting everything as clean as possible, we can try this finish again. So now a day's passed and I'm going to sand this down with some 600 grit, making sure to wipe the dust away as much as possible. And then we'll refinish this with another coat of Osmo. And then I'm going to repeat the process with 600 grit once more. After this finish, I'm going to apply one more coat without sand in between, and then you should really see the sheen jump up. So after letting it cure for three or four days, we can move it inside. And I got these legs from Fractal Design in London, Ontario. I was going to weld my own legs or build them out of walnut, but you can get these for I think like $205. So it seemed like a no-brainer just buy these professionally made and they come with all the inserts and leveling feet that you need. After measuring everything out, we can mark the holes and begin to drill them. One tip is put a little piece of painter's tape on your drill bit to mark the depth so that you don't accidentally drill too far and come out the top of your table. I also used a slightly bigger bit at the end there just to countersink the hole a little bit so you don't get any wood tear out. These are called ramp inserts and they're a two part piece that allows you to easily attach and detach the legs with an Allen screw. Now this table's pretty much done and we can flip it over. As a last optional step, I'm gonna apply some wax on top. You just apply this with a shop towel. And after letting it sit for five minutes, you can buff it off with a terry towel. This takes some elbow grease and just be sure to get every last little speck of it off and it'll really even out the sheen. So that'll do it for this build. Thanks so much for watching this video and if you made it this far, let me know what you think of the table below. If you want to see some of my other builds, I build a lot of random stuff, not just woodworking, so check out my channel. 
and be sure to subscribe. Also, if you're interested in my work, I do have a website at jaspermill.ca. Thank you.